So on this high holy day, brethren, I want to retell a little bit of the story of Pentecost. I want to update it from where we're, where, we, where we're living, where our perspective of where we are right now in 2014. So if you would turn with me, please, to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, of course, this is, this is the, where everything is happening according to this time in Pentecost. So Acts chapter 2, I'm going to read here, and when I, when I quote Acts chapter 2, I'm, I'm citing from the Amplified Version because I thought it was, uh, I thought it did a very good job of expanding what the meaning and, and being accurate with what the meaning is in this particular chapter. But in Acts chapter 2 verse 1, it starts off here, and when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they, that is the disciples, Jesus' uh, disciples, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you know, they were all there from that standpoint. So the, the, you know, they were there along with a bunch of other brethren. They were assembled together in one place. When the day of Pentecost had fully come. This, with the Greek word here, is sumplero. Sumplero, from Thayer, Thayer's Greek lexicon, says to complete entirely, be fulfilled, to complete entirely of time. Strong's exhaustive concordance defines it as, I love this word, to implenish completely, that's like of space, like for a boat that's being swamped by water, to completely fill it so then it's going to go down, implenish completely, or of time to accomplish, to fully come, to fully fill up. Now, what does this mean? You know, there's, this is an interesting thing in Scripture. And how does it relate to Pentecost and in 2014? Well, there's a great deal of confusion these days of when one counts to Pentecost. The Pharisees in Jesus' time counted the 50-day period of Pentecost differently from Christ and his disciples because the Pharisees counted from the first annual Sabbath, the first annual Sabbath during the days of unleavened bread. That is Abeb Nisan 14. So they always arrived at Sivan 6. This practice is still followed by the Orthodox Jews in, uh, in Israel today. And there are, I know that there are many uh, Messianic Jewish groups that do the same thing, that keep Sivan 6, and there are varieties of, of churches of God who do that too. But Jesus counted from the day after the weekly Sabbath. Uh, and, you know, it, this is very clear. He counted from the uh, day after the weekly Sabbath during unleavened bread, beginning the count from the first day of the week, the Sunday after the uh, crucifixion, which is known as the wave sheaf. If you turn with me, we can see this very clearly in the scriptures. Turn with me to John chapter 20. Now, it depends upon what translation of your Bible you're going to have, because most translations completely overlook this point, which is why I'm talking about it, because you probably aren't going to see it in your text. Coulter puts it this way. Now, on the first day of the weeks, that's weeks, that's plural. That's a literal uh, translation of the Greek word in the inspired text. In the first day of the weeks, not week, not singular, weeks, plural. First day of the weeks shows that this day, what is indicating very clearly in the text, this day which followed the weekly Sabbath uh, uh, after Jesus had been crucified during the days of unleavened bread, after he'd been crucified and resurrected, that it was the start of the 50-day count to Pentecost, or what we know also in Hebrew is Shavuot. Pentecost is the Greek word. Shavuot is the um, Hebrew word. Thus identifying this day, the first day of the weeks, as the day of the wave sheaf. So that's where we started to count this from. So where do we get this? Where do the instructions come? Well, the Bible tells us. Let's go to Leviticus 23. I want you to turn with me to Leviticus 23. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all assembled in one place. You know, because at the time of when the, the scriptures were written, with the time that they were written, 
You see, the Pharisees had already kept Siva on six. Uh, they had already kept uh, Siva. They had kept Pentecost a few days ago. In this particular year, it would have been a few days ago. They weren't keeping Pentecost today, okay, because they, they, they looked at it differently. But in, you see in Leviticus 23, where do we, why are we meeting today? It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, Concerning the appointed feast of the Lord, the, not the appointed feast of Moses, the appointed feast of the YHVH, the I Am, the great, you know, the, the God, who spoke from the top of Mount Sinai, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Okay, from this standpoint, now let's just drop down to verses 6 to 8. You see, and on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Love and Leavened Bread to the Lord. You must eat unleavened bread seven days. We did that, you know, more than 50 days ago. And on the first day, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any servile work. Okay, that was going to be the day the Pharisees decided to count from. But then we... The, um, but let's go down here, and as you shall uh, offer a fire offering to the Lord seven days, and on the seventh day is a holy convocation. Let's go down here to verse 10. And speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you have come into the land which I give you and shall reap the harvest of it, you shall bring of the premier sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted of you, on the next day after the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath during this is, is uh, you know, it's, it's, it is the word Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And let's go down to verse 15. And you shall count to you, beginning with the next day after the Sabbath, beginning with the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the day after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number 50 days, and you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. We do take up an offering on this day because it is a high holy day from that standpoint in the church of God. This is something we do. The wave sheaf marked the ascension of Jesus Christ, and he fulfilled this offering for all time. And we read about it just before, if you go back in John 20, in the first day of the weeks, that was the day that Jesus was going to ascend to, as he said to Mary Magdalene, to uh, our Father and my Father and your Father. So from this standpoint, we look at this, it was pretty clear that when Jesus and his disciples, we had just from this little hint in scriptures in Acts 2 and verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were assembled together. They understood the difference. What would have happened if they had assembled two or three days before or two or three days afterwards or any other time? They would not have been there, would they? For what was going to happen on the day of Pentecost, the room that they were, they were meeting. Now, I have a question I want to ask. Should a Christian follow example of the Pharisees? Or should he follow example of Jesus and his disciples? We could say the same thing, you know, if we want to update it into the 21st century, because most of us don't have necessarily that problem. Although, as I, you know, there are, as I said, there are a variety of Messianic Jewish congregations, and there are even some churches of God that keep Sivan 6 for Pentecost. But should they follow the example of the Pharisees? Should Christianity as a whole, let's say even that broaden the question a little bit, should they follow the example of the Pope in Rome and Martin Luther? And using the Roman calendar and substituting the days that they've done. Because, you know, there are a lot of churches that don't even pay attention to Pentecost anymore. It's, it's just one of those old Jewish festivals. But as I said, these are the feasts of the Lord. These are the feasts of the Lord, not the feasts of Moses. If we go here, I want you to see something here. Matthew, let's go turn to Matthew, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 8. I'm going to cite this in the New King James Version. There are a lot of people who put on religiosity this day. Yes, there's still a great show of religion, even though religion is, is declining as a whole in the society in the 21st century. There, there are fewer and fewer people who are involved in the traditional forms of religion. But anyways, Jesus said this in Matthew 15 and verses, and we'll start with verse 8. These people draw near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips. 
but their heart is far from me. And in vain, or as the Amplified Version would say, uselessly, in vain or uselessly, they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Whether it's the Pharisees who added to the law and changed his priorities of, you know, what was more important. You know, Jesus used to go around the, you know, <laughs> they, they went around and around about that. Or the Catholic Church with this doctrine of the primacy of Peter. And of course, the Protestants who follow the examples of the, of the Catholics, you know, that allow them to rewrite the Word of God completely and substitute what they want to substitute, a new calendar and with, with different reasons and all this sort of thing. They end up worshiping, what would they say? They're substituting the commandments of men and they're worshiping, God says, they're worshiping Him in vain. They're worshiping in uselessly. I would not have you do that. I would not. Because there is, you know, there are always consequences consequences to the choices we make. Let's go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. I want to cite this one in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Paul writes this, okay, and we were talking about this and then and yesterday on the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath we were talking about, uh, you know, from this basic area of the scriptures. Brothers, Paul said, my heart's desire, writing to the Roman brethren, and prayer to God for Israel is for their salvation. I can testify about them that they have zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And that's, that's true today. I don't doubt that the, you know, the Catholics and, and the evangelical Protestants and many others have the zeal for God. I, you know, they're sincere in this. I have no doubt it. But it, Paul says, but not according to knowledge. Not according to knowledge. Verse 3, because they disregard the righteousness from God and attempt to establish their own righteousness. They have not submitted themselves to God's righteousness. Now, I want to look, focus here on this verse 4. This is a crucial this is a difference, okay? We are the minority report in this uh, COG webcast, absolutely. And this is one of the reasons why. For Christ, in Romans 10, 4, is the end, and the Greek word is telos, of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The interlinear Bible, okay, in the way that the Greek text is put together, puts it this way. The end indeed of law is Christ to righteousness to everyone believing. What does this mean? Teleos. It's Strong's 50, 56. Properly, it's the consummation, the end goal, the purpose, such as the closure, uh, as, as closure with all its results. It's the culmination, reaching the end. It's reaching the end, reaching the aim of what it's all set out and what it's about. And as I've mentioned many times, it's, it's well illustrated by like the old Pyrus telescope where you would pull it out and it would come in sections and sections and sections until you had it fully extended and that was the teleos, the full extent. And, and so that it could be properly used, unfolding, extending out one stage at a time to function at full strength, capacity, effectiveness. Christ is the full strength, the effectiveness, the capacity of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. But you know, from the time of the Catholic writer Augustine in the 5th century AD on down, most Christians, the mainstream, have always interpreted telos, okay, meaning, you know, they say that's the law's termination termination, is extinction as being a relevant towards the lifestyle of those who are being saved. That's how they've looked at it. They, rather than understanding telos as meaning that Christ himself is the source and end product of the fullest expression of the law reaching its end goal. It's 
full maturity. The apostles of Jesus did not believe that Jesus Christ, you know, he terminated the law. It made it, you know, irrelevant to the life of a Christian. I want to repeat that again. The apostles of Jesus Christ did not believe that Jesus Christ abrogated or terminated the law so that it was irrelevant to the lifestyle of the Christian believer. No, instead they believed very clearly. They believed that Jesus in his pre-incarnate form was actually the YHVH, the I am of Exodus 3.14. The Apostle John clearly testified in his gospel, in the gospel of John, he, he cites Jesus' own declaration of his identity, his pre-incarnate identity in John 8, 58. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. And through that chapter, he goes, he repeats this point, actually, all leading up to that. He was risking being killed to say that. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, and they all drank of the same spiritual drink and they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Yeah, consequently, what we see is the pre-incarnate Christ was the one who actually gave the law, standing on top of Mount Sinai on Pentecost, or as the Hebrews would call it, Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. He's the one who gave the law. Now, I want to read something here. I don't want to make, I'm trying to make this point as clearly as possible. Because you see, the mainstream totally gets it wrong. And Christ's own words say they're worshiping him in vain or uselessly because they're teaching, they're te what they're teaching is comes from the doctrines of men rather than from the scriptures of God. This should be of concern to you. And I know it is for, for those of you who do turn into the Minority Report, and that's what the COG webcast is. But if we go here, let's go to 1 John and take a look at this here just a second. Let's go to 1 John chapter 3. I want to read just these first few verses. What did the apostles think? Well, I think what, you know, it's very clear. Apostle John being the last of the uh, living apostles, whose hands had touched Jesus Christ, who had been with Christ in person for three years and had known him during his ministry. He said, Behold, what glorious love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. For this very reason the world does not know it, because it did not know him. Beloved, now are we the children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is manifested, we will be like him because we shall see him exactly as he is. When Christ return, he will bring his saints with him. They will come up, everyone in the order of his, his, his resurrection, those who are Christ at his return will be resurrected. And we're going to, we, we, we are going to be like him, be like him. We're called to glory. Verse 3, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. God calls us, we are to be holy as he is holy. That's the standard of righteousness that he expects from us. In verse 4, everyone who practices sin, that's 1 John 3, 4. Everyone who practices sin is also practicing lawlessness. For sin is lawlessness. Greek word is antinomia or anomia, without law. They live as though the scriptures and what the scriptures have to say have no application. It is these people who say Christ came to terminate, abrogate the law that he's talking about. This is shocking stuff. It's shocking stuff. 
this, you know, when you look at the last 2,000 years and you look at uh, the mainstream of Christianity, you see the results. Everyone who practices sin is also practicing lawlessness, for sin is lawlessness. And you know that he appeared in order that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Everyone who dwells in him does not practice sin. Apostle Paul, Apostle John is saying, Anyone who practices sin has not seen him, nor has known him. Little children, do not allow anyone to deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God appeared that he might destroy the works of the devil. Everyone who has been begotten by God does not practice sin. See, the whole message of Pentecost is, you know, when the, the coming of the Holy Spirit, to begot, you know, to begat the, uh, the children of God, that we might see no longer be carnal, but we become spiritual. Everyone who has been begotten by God does not practice sin because his seed of begettal is dwelling within him and he is, able to uh, he is not able to practice sin because he has been begotten of God. His conscience would bother him too much. The Holy Spirit won't dwell with a lifestyle of sin. It won't. Jesus himself if you still don't believe me that when, when, when the whole point of, uh, of what it was saying here in 1 Corinthians, in, in 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 4, that Christ is, Christ is the end of the law, the culmination, the full maturity of this, not abrogating it, but fulfilling it fully, we can see this, it's even, you know, the Bible is pretty clear about this and about Jesus' standpoint on this. Again, let's go to Matthew chapter 13 and verse 40. Let's see what Matthew had to say, quoting Christ's own words. Christ explaining to his disciples in private, he said to them, Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin, all the traps, the scandal on, all the traps of sin that people fall into. He's going to gather out of his kingdom all the causes of sin. Whoever is deceiving other people and those who are practicing lawlessness. Anomianism, lawlessness. Those who are practicing lawlessness will be gathered out of the kingdom of Christ. And what's going to be the result? Verse 42, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Those are, if you believe the scriptures, <laughs> if you believe what they say, it's pretty clear. Yet there have been theologians from the time of Augustine and probably earlier and on down who say that Christ, you know, did away with it. We don't have to, we can do, what, we can do our own thing. We can do whatever, you know, groups of men tell us is okay. Well, who are you going to believe? We at COG Webcast are the minority report, that's for sure. When it comes to understanding what Christianity and the Bible are all about, so what is the goal of COG Webcast? What should be our purpose in ministry? What should be the purpose of the church? You know, let's take a look here. Let's just, let's just take a look here in Ephesians 4.12. I want to just cite this here. Day of Pentecost is very important. What is the purpose of our ministry? What would Christ have us do? In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12, I'll be citing this in the Amplified Version. His intention, that's Christ's intention, is the perfecting and full equipping of the saints, his consecrated people. That they should do the work of ministering toward building up Christ's body, the church, 
verse 13, that it might develop until we all attain oneness in the faith and in the comprehension of the full and accurate knowledge of the Son of God. Not that we should be content with half-truths, deceptions, that we might arrive at a really mature manhood, that complete of personality, which is nothing less than the standard height of Christ's own perfection. See, Christ is the teleos of the law, is the full fulfillment. It is, the com it is arriving at the full completion of the height, the full maturity, the measure of the stature and the fullness of Christ and completeness found in him. See, that's what we're to do. That's what we're to teach. Verse 14, so then we may no longer be children tossed like ships to and fro between the chance gusts of teaching and wavering with every cunning, changing wind of doctrine. The prey of the cunning and the cleverness of unscrupulous men in every form of trickery in inventing errors to mislead. Rather, let our lives lovingly express truth Enfolded in love, let us grow up in every way, in all things, into him who is the head, Christ. That is the Messiah, the Anointed One. For this perfecting of the saints, you know, it, it, the Greek word here is katartismos. It's only used here in the scriptures. It's bringing to a condition of fitness, perfecting an exact judgment that enables all the individual parts to work together in the correct order. See, that's why Christ is the culmination. He's the end. He's the aim of what we're all doing because we're growing up into being fully mature spiritually as he is. But yet, brethren, there are many people. They fill the airwaves. They are today. And they're teaching the doctrines of men and leading people to worship Christ in vain, uselessly. It's been going on for centuries, and, but we know that time it will end because Christ will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all the causes of sin, all the traps, all the scandal on, and all those who are practicing lawlessness. This is what he says. Do you believe him? If you believe them, you know, it's good, well and good. I mean, the words of Christ are clear. The words of the apostles and the testimony of the apostles are clear. Let's go back to Acts 2, though. Acts 2 and verse 1, because this is where the church began. Why? We'll see why the church began here. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, you know, there's so much meaning in that, wasn't there? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm going to have to move along here because, you know, it's always the scriptures are rich, are rich. And people read over so often, even the littlest things. And yet it's so much there. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all assembled together in one place. When suddenly there came a sound from heaven like the rushing of a violent tempest blast, and it filled the whole house in which they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues resembling fire, which were separated and distributed, and which settled on each one of them. Separated, distributed, okay, this, 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 the Holy Spirit. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages. The Amplified says different foreign languages. As the Spirit gave them clear and loud expression, that is, in each tongue, in appropriate words. Now there were residing in Jerusalem Jews, devout and God-fearing men from every country under heaven. And when this sound was heard, the multitude came together, and they were astonished and bewildered, because each one of them heard the apostles speaking, gibberish, garbage, whatever it might be. You turn in on the TV some of these days, or you go into a variety of services, those in the Pentecostal movement, and what do you hear? What do you hear? Do you hear what the testimony is? Do you hear what the testimony is in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost? What is the testimony? 
The multitude came together and they were astonished and bewildered because each one of them heard the apostle speaking in his own particular dialect. And they were beside themselves with amazement. Not that they were madmen, speaking nonsense, saying, aren't all these men who are talking Galileans, you know, hillbillies. <laughs> you, know, these, you know, who are these country bumpkins? They're, and they know all, you know, they're, they're all of a sudden acting like they're cosmopolitans and they know all these other languages. Verse 8, then how is it that we hear each of us in our own particular dialect to which we were born? And then it lists the different languages. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and inhabitants of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and the province of Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya about Cyrene and the transient residents from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians too. We hear them speaking in our own native tongues, telling of the mighty works of God. It was understandable to these people. It was a miracle. All right, okay. So how do millions of people in 2014 2,000 years approximately or so later, get caught up in the Pentecostal movement, thinking that in speaking gibberish, standing up there and doing that, just you know, shows that they have a higher level of spirituality than people who can't do that. Well, well, well. Hey, come on guys, what does it say? Yet there are millions of people who are caught up in the doctrines of men. And they're vainly worshiping Christ. Uselessly, the scriptures say. Is that you? Do you know people who are caught up in this? Well, you know, the apostles were called to preach the gospel loud and clear. Not confound it and confuse it with nonsense. <laughs> What is it? Do you believe the scriptures? Okay, let's go back. Acts chapter 2, and let's go to verse 12. And all were beside themselves with amazement, and were puzzled and bewildered, saying to one another, What can this mean? But, you know, there's always some in a crowd, right? <laughs> there's always some in a crowd, but others made a joke of it and derisively said, They are simply drunk and full of sweet wine. <laughs> <laughs> but Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. You Jews and all you residents of Jerusalem, let this be explained to you so that you will know and understand. Listen closely to what I have to say. For these men are not drunk as you imagine, for it is only the third hour of the day, about 9 a.m. You'd have to be a real alcoholic to be, you know, to be boozed up at by 9 a.m. in the morning. Verse 16, but instead, this is the beginning of what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, the apostle Peter said. In the last days. We are in the last days. They, you know, they've been going on now for almost 2,000 years. In a few more years, what, 16 years, it'll be exactly 2,000 years. You know, 2030, we're coming up to exactly 2,000 years when, these, when this event actually happened. Think about that. Is there significance coming? Verse 17, And it shall come to pass in the last days, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. That is, telling forth divine counsels, and your young men shall see visions, divinely granted appearances or thoughts like Joseph. And your old men shall dream, or I should say Daniel, and your old men shall dream dreams. People like Joseph. Verse 18. Yes, and on my men servants also, and on my maid servants in the, uh, those days, I will pour out my spirit. God's going to pour out, he says. His spirit. This was what was prophesied in Joel. 
about 700 years before the day of Pentecost in 30 AD. Verse 19, And I will show wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire and smoking vapor. Okay, here we're, you know, he's skipping forward to a period of time getting closer to where, you know, thousands of years after that first Pentecost. These are the last days. We've entered into that period, but, you know, th things have started, but they haven't ended, have they? And the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the obvious day of the Lord comes, the great and notable and conspicuous and renowned day. And it shall be that whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. That's evoking, adoring, worshiping the Lord Jesus, the way the Amplified would put it, shall be saved. Shall be saved. You know, the series, you know, talking about the resurrection from the dead, that's the salvation we see. So check it out on, on our website. You know, if you miss some of those, they will be posted. Verse 22, you men of Israel, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man accredited and pointed out and shown forth and commended and attested to you by God, by the mighty works, the power that he had to perform things. Others even knew that he was a man sent by God because no man could do what he was doing. They knew that. But in spite of knowing those things, in spite of the clear testimony and witness, these people had hardened hearts. They couldn't understand it. Just like the scriptures right now are clear and open, and yet the religious of this world, the mainstream in Christianity, their heart is hardened and they're blinded and they don't understand these things. They continue to preach the doctrines of men and uselessly worship Christ according to his own words. Anyways, a man accredited and pointed out and shown forth and commended and tested by God by the mighty works, wonders, and signs which God worked through him right in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, when delivered up according to the definite and fixed purpose and settled plan and foreknowledge of God, God had it all planned out. That is the greatness of God his incredible wisdom, and not only to have the idea, but to execute it and bring it about. To the minutest detail, 30 pieces of silver, dividing his clothes, casting lots for it, all that stuff. He had it fulfilled. He had it written about. The scriptures are valid. They give the witness. They give the witness. The definite, fixed purpose and settled plan and foreknowledge of God. He says, this Jesus you crucified and put out of the way. That is to say, killing him. By the hands of lawless and wicked men. In the Greek, the straight Greek, if you were to go literally, it says, delivered up by hands lawless. This is what the Greek straight reads, straightly reads, literally delivered up by hands lawless. Anomos, properly, no law, without regard for the divine th authority of Scripture. And yet some say, you know, you know, Christ, you know, abrogated the law. No, it was the lawless who killed Christ. <laughs> it was the lawless. Just like they're deceiving the world right now. And people in this making religion in vain, their worship in vain and useless. It's what God says. It's not what I say. It's not what Jeff Patton says. Read the scriptures. Verse 24, but God raised him up, liberating him from the pangs of death, seeing that it was not possible for him to continue to be controlled or retained by it. Yet yeah, do look into this whole you know, series on the resurrection, five-part series that we just completed here last, this past Sabbath. Verse 25, For David says in regard to him, citing Psalms 16, verses 8 to 11, I saw the Lord continually before me, for he, <laughs> for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken or overthrown or cast down. From See, David saw that, and he wrote that, because God is our help. 
we should not be shaken nor overthrown. We need to have faith and persist in this persuasion that God is giving us through the witness of the scripture and the presence of his Holy Spirit. Verse 26, therefore my flesh rejoiced and my tongue exulted exceedingly. Moreover, my flesh also shall dwell in hope. The language here, shall dwell in hope, is like will encamp. It's going to, the, it will pitch its tent. It will dwell in hope of anticipation of the resurrection. That's what we're anticipating is the resurrection. Dwelling in hope. Verse 27, for you will not abandon my soul, leaving it helpless in Hades. You know, this, this place of the departed spirits, the great data bank, if you want to put it to, that God collects all, you know, the, the spirits in man, all of our individuality from which he can bring us back for the judgment. Nor let your Holy One know decay or see destruction of the body after death. Okay, so here was a prophecy that Christ wasn't going to sit in, in the, the grave in Gethsemane and, and just rot and fall apart in his bones. And they would collect him after about six months and put it in a little ossuary and stuff like that. That's how they did it. No, that wasn't going to happen. Verse 28, you have made known to me the ways of life. You will enrapture me, diffusing my soul with joy, with and in your presence. Verse 29, brethren, it is permitted me to tell you confidently and with freedom concerning the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being, however, a prophet and knowing that God had sealed to him with an oath that he would set one of his descendants on his throne. See, God keeps his promises. Christ was descended from David. He will sit on his throne over Israel and the world and in the kingdom. Verse 31, he's uh, foreseeing this, spoke by foreknowledge of the resurrection of Christ, that he was not deserted in death and left in Hades, nor did his body know decay and destruction. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are his witnesses, Peter was saying to the crowd. We are his eyewitnesses. They were willing to risk their lives to tell this message. It was extremely politically incorrect at that time, just as it's incorrect right now. The resurrection from the dead, still incorrect. Faith in God, following the example of Jesus Christ, living the lifestyle of those who are being redeemed. Still incorrect. Verse 33, the, being therefore lifted up high and by the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has made this outpouring of which you yourselves both see and hear. This outpouring, a strong 1632, a checo, or cheo, excuse me, cheo, pouring out. It's a pouring out of a liquid or, or solid. Remember, the Spirit was poured out separately and individually to each of them. Yeah, there's a major doctrine that sort of confuses this interest, you know, in the mainstream Christian church that confuses this. He has made this outpouring, which you yourselves both see and hear. Verse 34, for David did not ascend into the heavens. Oh, let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. We'll just have a real quick review here for this standpoint. For, for a fuller explanation, go into the series I just that's going to be posted uh, on the web. Check our site and you can follow some of this. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 22. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ the first fruit. Of course, this is the feast of first fruits. <laughs> and Christ is the first of the first fruits. And the church is the rest of the first fruits. It says, Christ the first fruit, then those who are Christ at his coming. 
each one, we're going to be made alive. Those who are Christ will be there at his coming. Afterwards, the end comes when he shall deliver up the kingdom of God, when he deliver up to, to him who is God and Father. Follow, you know, check it out. You know, we, we, you know it's a great series. You should, you should look at it. But David, he said in verse 34, but David did not ascend into heaven. No, of course not. He's waiting for that return of Christ to be raised in his own order because he's Christ and he belongs to him. He foresaw, he prophesied of what he, of, of what he was. He had the Holy Spirit. He, he did not ascend into the heavens. No, the only one who ascended into heaven is Christ, the wave sheaf. No man, no human being. You know, this whole, this whole thing that's sweeping the evangelical Christian community once again. You know, the heaven is real, you know, this thing, and they're going to bananas about this. So again, they're teaching the doctrines and commandments of men, and they're worshiping Christ in vain, teaching a lie. Common, painfully common, painfully wrong. Hey. For David did not ascend into heaven, yet he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make my, uh, share my throne. Until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Citing the, the coming establishment of the kingdom of God. You should read it in Psalm 110. There are going to be a lot of people who aren't going to welcome Christ to come back and do this, by the way. Scriptures plainly indicate that. Verse 36, Therefore let the whole house of Israel recognize beyond all doubt and acknowledge assuredly that Christ has made him both, what? Lord. Okay, Kyrios, referring directly from what they knew in the Septuagint, or referring to the YHVH, the God of the Old Covenant made him both Lord and Christ, the Moshiach, the Messiah. He's made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Wow, zing. <laughs> Boy, that was a zinger that Peter laid on him, this crowd of people listening to him. Verse 37, now when they heard this, they were stung. They were pricked. It hurt. They were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter answered them, repent. Change your views and purpose to accept the will of God in your inner selves and stop rejecting it. We can still say that to people. Change your views. Stop believing deceptions, lies, traditions of men. Stop doing it. Repent. Do you want to be at Christ's coming? You want to be there? Raised from the dead? Every man in his own order. Those who are Christ's at his coming. And then there's the judgment. You, you're, you will be raised from the dead. The question is whether, <laughs> but it's going to be a little bit different. There's a better and there's a not so good. Okay, or it's not, you know, which one do you want to be in? You're not going to heaven. You can, you can think about all you want. I'm going to die and go to heaven. No, you're not. Mm -mm, it's not what it says. Repent and be baptized. Not sprinkled. Immersed. Baptized. Planted in a symbolic death. Raised in life. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of and release from your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So you have to repent and be baptized before you can receive the Holy Spirit. Essential. Most people haven't, you think of themselves as Christians, haven't really repented. And many of them haven't even been baptized by the way the Bible puts it. So, anyways, verse 39, for the promise of the Holy Spirit is to you and your children and to all and for all that are far away, 
even to as many as the Lord our God invites and bids to come to himself. Let's go to Jeremiah 31. What was happening? What was happening on that day in Pentecost, back in 30 AD? That started at that point in time. Go back to Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. And we'll go to verse 37. Behold, the days come, says the Lord. The YHVH, okay, in Hebrew in the text. The one who Jesus said before Abraham was, I'm this guy. The one who Paul, Apostle Paul testified, and the rock that followed him was Christ. The one that Peter said there on the day of Pentecost, this Jesus is made with Lord and Messiah, Lord and Christ. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, and I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant which I made with the fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which covenant of mine they broke. They transgressed. They couldn't, they, they couldn't keep it. They're just carnal people. Although I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. How is he going to do it? I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Christ is the end of the law, the culmination, the fulmination, the fulfillment. Because in the, every believer, the one who has repented and been, been baptized and received the Holy Spirit, the law will be within them. It will be part of them. So how is it that some say that the law is abrogated? That the law is terminated. You can do as you please. Ignore the scriptures. Set up the commandments of men. You know, do whatever we want. Change the calendar. How is it that they say this? How is it? I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall no more teach each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. Yeah, know what he's all about. <laughs> know what he's all about. You know, don't, don't fall for all the deceptive nonsense. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and will remember their sins no more. For thus is the Lord who gives the sun for a light by day and the ordinances of the moon of the, uh, of the stars for a light by night, who stirs up the sea when its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from me, says the Lord, the seed of Israel shall cease from being a nation before me forever. For thus is the Lord, if the heavens can be measured and the foundations of the earth below can be searched out, then I will cast off the seed of Israel for all they've done, says the Lord. But it's not going to happen. Because as we saw in the series we just finished, as it says in Romans 11:26, And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, out of Zion shall come a deliverer. And he shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is the covenant which I will make with them when I have taken away their sins. This is the covenant, the new covenant. Pentecost is the beginning of the church of God. It's the beginning of the new covenant in which the law is put in the hearts and in the minds of the believers. Not for them to ignore, but for it to be part of them, to live it's sort of integral to the beings, just like Christ himself, the one who gave it. 
standing on top of Mount Sinai on a Pentecost feast of weeks so many years earlier before the Apostle Peter stood up. I guess it was, uh, you know, getting towards almost 1,500 years later at the time when the Holy Spirit was given. We're almost 2,000 years later. It is the last days. Brethren, let us have faith. Let us rethink about and, and, and consider, meditate deeply on what is being said because we can look forward very much to the future and the kingdom of God and being with Christ at his return. This is the beginning. It's the beginning of the church. It's the anniversary, the birthday, if you would be, of this great hope that the children of God, that we can look forward to living in all eternity in this everlasting covenant with our Father and our elder brother, Jesus Christ.